Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? I know that uh, some of you are just getting your desserts. Uh, please enjoy your uh, uh, pudding, uh, particularly the way John Marshall enjoyed his bread pudding. But in order to expedite matters, I'd like to begin the rest of our program. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you this evening's very distinguished speaker. And it's really beyond my capabilities to give our esteemed guest an introduction worthy of his name. I will simply say that it is my great personal honor to introduce to you the first citizen of our republic, a great patriot in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you His Excellency, the first president of these United States, the Honorable General George Washington. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, Dr. Gould, you do me great honor with that introduction. I must tell you with the frankness of true friendship that I was somewhat inclined to decline the great honor of addressing you. I have never considered myself a great orator like Mr. Patrick Henry or Mr. Richard Henry Lee, nor have I ever earned any laurels as a scholar. And it has been a maxim with me since my youth never to lecture at people in those areas where they profess knowledge. So when I thought about it, however, I thought it might be thought of as prideful on my part to refuse to address such a fine assemblage of scholars and citizens. The question became then, what do I talk to you about? When I rummage through my library, though not as large as Mr. Jefferson's perhaps, it is still a fairly large library, but most of the works are of a military nature or agriculture not fitting for such a festive occasion. But I did come across a book, a little, little more than a pamphlet, called Commentaries on a Map of Hindustan. And as I read it, I realized that perhaps here might be a topic to discuss myself with you with. If I understand the author correctly, in that most interesting of religions, the Hindu religion, each man goes through four phases of life, much like, like Mr. Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man. According to the author, if I understand correctly, they are student, striver, success, and then one other which I will come to shortly. And as I reflected upon my life, I realized that indeed in many ways my life did follow such a pattern. I was born February 11th, 1732 in my father's Pope's Creek Plantation in Westmoreland County, Virginia. I see no one amongst the audience old enough, except perhaps Dr. Gould, <laughs> to remember when England and her colonies changed their calendar from the old Roman one to the one that the rest of Europe had adopted. Thus, 11 days were added. My birthday was moved to the 22nd. I always celebrated the 22nd in public and the 11th in private, so I had two birth dates every year. I was born to the middling class. My father was neither very rich nor very poor. And since there were no public schools in Virginia when I was a lad, I was tutored at home. I received education as befitting a man who would grow up to be a planter someday. I had mathematics up through the geometry, reading and writing, no liberal education. The dealing with such business forms as a planter might be expected to know. But then my father died when I was but 11 years of age, and thus precluded any possibility of me going to England to continue my education as my elder half-brothers had. I am the oldest son of my father's second marriage. And so, set adrift in a way, it came upon me to find a way to continue my education by myself. And this began a pattern that I think I have held up through all my life taking what I already know, applying it to new situations, and then learning from the new situations. With the aid of a book of surveying, which my father had left me, 
and some instruments that he had also left me, and with the mathematics I had already had, I taught myself that most interesting of skills, and I learned enough to go down to the College of William and Mary and receive from them a certificate making me surveyor of Culpeper County, Virginia. I was very happy as a surveyor. It suited my interest, the exactness of surveying. And it was a source of ready money, which was always interesting. And as I was out in the woods surveying for other gentlemen earning ready money, I could spy which lands in the West were still open and begin my purchases, for I have always felt that the West was the future of our country. And so I have graduated from student to striving. But again, I am still a student of life. I'm learning. So the differentiation of the different ages are not exact. And as a striver, I tried to improve myself. But outside influences began to bear down upon me. Now, the King of France and the King of England had differing ideas over who owned much of North America. Uh, England and Virginia claimed from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi and up to the Great Lakes for Virginia. And of course, the King of France wanted access to the Mississippi for his northern colonies to be able to do their trade with. And he began to send troops down into areas claimed by Virginia and England. So at the age of 19, I volunteered to do a dangerous assignment. I was made a major, sent to the Northwest in the dead of winter with snow to the knees as far as the eye could see, with the idea that I was to warn off the French and to spy upon their strengths. When I succeeded in this, I made the trip. I met the French commander. I politely told him he must leave the king's land. He politely told me no. And I proceeded back. And on the way back to report to Governor Dinwiddie, there occurred the first of, of many instances in my life which made me wonder what my purpose here on this earth was. I fell in with a native who offered to guide me part of the way. And after a few miles of traveling, he turned and from a distance of that wall to me, aimed his rifle at me, fired, and missed. <laughs> well, he ran off and I continued upon my errand. I reported to the governor. I had my report published in Williamsburg, and for my efforts I was made a colonel in the Virginia militia, given a small body of men, sent back out to the Northwest with the idea to stop the French advances. Well, there were many things that I did not know and did not learn. I had read a couple of books on the art of warfare, and I thought myself fit for command. I was the one who ordered the first shot fired in what became known as the French and Indian War. That war is more important to you, perhaps, because we are speaking English here rather than French. But we had surrounded a group of Frenchmen who were in a position of spying upon us. I ordered the shots fired. Uh, several of them were killed or wounded. And we began to try and take the rest prisoners, but as the learned gentleman pointed out earlier, the Indian allies I had were not always under my control and they killed many of them outright against my express order. After this adventure, we fell back to a place I called Fort Necessity in Pennsylvania. I had built it with a stockade round and I had built a, uh, cleared the field for a uh, rifle's length all around it as I had read how to do. And I was very proud of this, but my Indian ally, the half-king, called it that little thing in the meadow before he left with his troops, leaving me and the rest of the Virginians to face the advancing French who were angry over the death of their troops. They fell upon us, and here my lack of military education began to tell. I had neglected a hill off to one side. And of course, the French and Indians seized it and were able to fire down upon us with deadly effect. I had also built my fort in a depression in the meadow. And of course, it began to rain. Our powder became wet, and I was forced to surrender. And the brother of one of those gentlemen, also Jean Moville, presented me with a document that he asked me to sign in French, which of course I have no word of any foreign language in my abilities. 
uh, Peter Fry, Gist, was the one who was supposed to know French, but he was really fairly illiterate. He translated Illinois as Black Islands, and he assassinated a word which came to haunt me later. I had agreed that I had caused the younger Jean Mauville to be killed, but the French word was assassinated. And there's a difference there if you are a politician that can come back to haunt you. For many years, the French hated me because uh, they assumed I had assassinated young Jean Mauville. At any rate, by signing this document, we were given the honors of war and allowed to return. I returned to the field. I stayed until 1759. I was with General Braddock when he suffered his disastrous defeat. Now, General Braddock has received much criticism. He was a fine European commander. He was used to fighting in ranks and files and firing in volley because the British muskets did not have rifling and were inaccurate. And so a large volley was better than an attempt to hit off individuals. And as we marched towards what we called Fort Pitt, up in the, the area around Pittsburgh, we were stretched out for two miles in a road that we had to cut through the virgin forest with the trees over top of us. And as we stretched out and the vanguard forded the river before the fort, the French and Indians filtered in on either side and they began to fire upon us with deadly effect. It was little short of a massacre. Of the 1,500 men, three quarters of them were casualties. Of the officers, I was the only one not killed or wounded, and as it was, I had two bullets through my jacket, two horses shot out from underneath me, and a bullet through my cap. And when General Braddock, who refused to let me take the Virginians into the woods and fight the Indians in their own style, when he received his mortal wound, but it fell to me to lead the troops to safety. I did this by ordering our goods and supplies scattered upon the road as we made our retreat. And if you can imagine that retreat on a moonless night with the trees towering overhead, it was, it was so dark that you had to feel your way upon the path to make sure that you were still on it. With the groans of the dead and the dying ringing in your ears. Well, it, it would appear as a heart of stone. So in 1759, I took three steps to change my life. I retired from the military, I thought, forever. I was elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses, the ruling body of all Virginia. And I married Miss Martha Dandridge Custis, one of the most wealthy widows in all of the colony. And with her money, I began to try and make my plantation, Mount Vernon, one of the finest in Virginia. So I have become now a second attempt at striving, striving to be a pillar of my community. I was a vestryman at church. I was still a student, however. I sent away for books on agriculture. I remember one I bought called A New Method of Agriculture or A Quick Way to Grow Rich. <laughs> it proved to be neither. <laughs> but I wanted to be a scientific farmer. What I did is I timed my workers at task when I was there watching them work, seeing what they could accomplish in a given amount of time, and that way I would know what they should be able to accomplish when I was not there to watch over them. I built a large trowel with sections where I put in soils for my plantations with different manures to see which was the best combination for my crops. And I was one of the first farmers in Virginia to switch from tobacco to wheat. Now tobacco has always been the reason for Virginia ever since the first founding. But tobacco is very ruinous. It tires out the soil. After a few years of growing tobacco, you must let the field set fallow for 20 or 30 years for it to regain its strength. But if you switch to wheat and use a proper scientific rotation, you can keep the same fields in play constantly. Wheat is much less labor intensive, and so it freed up labor for other things. I built a grist mill on my, one of my plantations in order to grind my wheat into flour, which I could trade in the Caribbean for a ready profit. I also built a schooner where I fished for herring on the Patamac River, which I could again trade in the Caribbean, all for ready money. 
And so I was a great deal along the way of becoming the success that we all strive to be. However, once again, outside influences intruded upon my life. Now the King of Britain was in debt a great deal of money because of the French and Indian War. He was in debt 63 million pounds. Let me say this now, there is no government but there will be taxes. And there is no tax that does not fall upon one person more so than another. But Parliament and this new system of theirs was attempting to, us, to tax us without our say-so. Ever since the founding of Virginia with the charter that gave us and our descendants forever the same rights and privileges as free-born Englishmen, we have always enjoyed the right to elect those who will tax us. The idea that someone 3,000 miles away, a parliament where we have no one elected to speak for us, the idea that they can tax us without our consent is ruinous. As Mr. Marshall has said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Now, they began slowly, Sugar Acts, Townsend Acts, Paper Acts, and every time we protested they would retreat, but always they would come back with more things, an attempt to impose the tax. The tea dumped in Boston Harbor and in Yorktown Harbor was the cheapest tea in the world at that time. The East India Company had subsidized the entire cost of tea except for the two pence per pound tax. If we had agreed to pay it, then we would have agreed that the tax was just and we would have been enslaved forever. And after 10 years of protests, it became obvious to me that they were attempting a systematic attempt to reduce us to the level of slaves, like those blacks over whom we hold such arbitrary sway. Now, the taking up of arms should always be a last resort. But in my mind, the King of England had no more right to reach into my pocket for my money without my consent than I would have to reach into any of your pockets. And slowly it became obvious that we were going to have to fight. I was lucky enough to be in Richmond Town when Mr. Henry gave his famous speech of give me liberty or give me death. I attended that conference in the uniform of the Fairfax County Independent Company of Men. The House of Burgesses had been dissolved. Virginia was in a state of nature, but man has a natural right to self-defense. And so independent companies, independent of the, mil of the government, were popping up. Thomas Marshall, son, father to John, was at my home a few days before that, tendering me command of Culpeper Independent Company. On the way down, I reviewed the Dumfries Independent Company. It was my, in my mind to be ready, to have Virginia ready, my country ready, for the fight that I saw coming. And one of the things we did at St. John's Church in Richmond was to elect delegates to the Second Continental Congress. I was foolish enough to wear my uniform there. And in the meantime, the fighting in Lexington and Concord had begun. So, Mr. Adams, that consummate politician, looking around and realizing that a Virginian was needed for this thing because Virginia was the richest, the largest, and the most populous colony. And they did not want it to be merely a New England war, but a continental war, looked over at me and nominated me and I told Congress I did not think I was capable of the task. True, I had commanded soldiers, but I had never commanded soldiers on horseback. I had never commanded soldiers with cannon. I had never commanded a navy. And I was expected to defend a coastline of 1,500 miles against the most powerful navy in the world. And we had no navy at all. <coughs> As I told Congress, I did not think I could do it, but I could not in honor refuse. So now I am still striving, but now I am striving for the good of my country. Now, the eight years of the war cannot be summoned up easily. I will touch upon a few. The Battle of Breed's Hill, which is often called Bunker Hill for some reason. I was not in command, and it was a defeat for us, but it was a defeat only because we ran out of gunpowder. As it was, three quarters of the British soldiers who marched up the hill did not march back down. And though we lost the hill, it proved a few things to me. 
It proved to me that the average American farmer or shopkeeper could stand up in battle against the trained British professional. And more importantly, that if we lost a man, well, we had to reach but a mile inland to find his brother to come and take his stead. But if England lost a man, she had to reach across 3,000 miles of ocean to find a replacement, if one could be found. For remember, she was fighting not only us, she was fighting Spain and France, Holland. She was fighting on four continents, and in many ways, we were the least of her worries, which is why eventually she had to resu uh, resort to hire Hessian mercenaries. She did not have the manpower. And I realized that it was not possible for England to send over enough men to occupy so vast an area as our country was threatening to become. So, with this knowledge, I became aware that I could never engage in a battle with the enemy where they could crush the revolution at one blow. Thus, I had to retreat a great many times when my instincts were to attack, but I could not put the cause in jeopardy where we could be defeated at one blow. The battle at Princetown was a very small military affair. And we lost two or three soldiers, I believe, killed, uh, we captured or wounded some 80 Hessian soldiers. I was in command, but while it was a small military victory, it was an important political victory. Now we had, after our victory in Boston, driven the British out of Boston, but they went down to New York. I tried to hold New York, but you cannot hold an island against a strong navy if you have no navy at all. And so that defeat there, being driven through New Jersey, and Christmas was coming, and the New Year's, and at the end of the New Year, most of my troops would be finished with their service. I would be left with 1,200 men to prosecute the war. As I wrote my brother from camp, the game is very nearly up. And so I decided to do something bold. And when we cross the river, the Delaware, at Christmas time, again, though it was a small uh, military victory, it convinced the American people that we could remain in the field. And if they remained with us, as long as the American people support the government, no nation can ever send enough troops here to conquer us. Now, the battle at Yorktown was important, and I was nominally in command, but the most important battle before that occurred a few days off the coast of Virginia, the Battle of Virginia Capes. Now, I had mentioned that we had never had a navy, and this cost us a great deal of trouble throughout the war. Whenever we had the enemy trapped, they merely had to take the ocean, go down somewhere else, and attack again. Cornwallis had rampaged through the Carolinas and up through Virginia, to disrupt the supply line that we were giving to the north. And he went to Yorktown, which was a deep water port, with the idea that he would be lifted off and go elsewhere. But he did not know of the arrival of the French fleet. And so when they were able to successfully blockade the Chesapeake Bay, Cornwallis was trapped. And while I was nominally in command, I had no knowledge of siege warfare, the idea that you dig trenches and then run tr uh, trenches forward and do parallels and bring your mortars forward. Now the French army was there, but they were not there, sent by the king to see one king be overthrown by its people. What the king of France wanted from us was to ha defeat his old enemy, and if the cards were played right, perhaps he could regain some of the land lost in the late war, French and Indian War. Either way, we welcomed his money and men and supplies and the French offered us victory at Yorktown, and we were able to seize it. And so after the war, I retired and I went home, and I had finally stepped up to the final, the uh, next step. I was a success. I had my name echoing throughout the world. I had refused the idea of being a king, and this was deemed a novel idea. And I went home to Mount Vernon to try and repair the ravages, caused by the war to float gently down the stream of life till I could rest with my fathers. But once again, outside influences intruded upon my life. Now we had won our war under the Articles of Confederation. 
a loose joining of 13 sovereign nations brought together by the crisis of the war. No man has, and I believe could, suffered more under the Articles of Confederation than I did. In my mind, it prolonged the war by several years. Every time I needed men or money or supplies to prosecute the war, I had to go to 13 sovereign heads of state and beg them for what they could give. Some states gave much or all of what we asked for. Some states gave some, and some states, I am sorry to say, gave little or nothing. We were like a giant with 13 heads tottering towards destruction. I had not spent eight years in the field watching my men die, not to give this grand experiment in liberty that we were undertaking its fullest possible chance to succeed. For make no mistake about this, America is the last best hope of mankind. If we fail in our experiment to prove that men can judge themselves and lead themselves, then tyrants forever will be able to look back upon us and say, see, men must be ridden like animals. And so when the idea was put forth for a convention to fix the Articles of Confederation, I reluctantly came out of retirement and attended. The gentlemen there in their wisdom chose me as the president of that convention when I was surely one of the least educated and least intelligent persons there. So I showed my leadership by stepping back and letting the learned gentlemen argue. They had the history of every government ever created by man to draw from. And though the document they came up with is far from perfect, in my mind, it is little short of a miracle that such a document meeting the needs of so many differing peoples could be written at all. And it has this to recommend it. If there be things that future generations do not care for, there are enclosed within the document itself safe and stable ways to make amends. Now, when the gentlemen were discussing the office of a chief officer, an executive officer, I'm not so dim, but I could see that they were, they were tailoring a suit of clothing much to a gentleman of my size. I can tell you honestly, I did not wish the honor. I considered myself too uneducated. I was aware of the 10,000 embarrassments that my lack of education would cost me. And I would wish that they would go with someone younger. But once my country called me, I could not with honor refuse it. I went to the office of the presidency like a thief goes to the gallows. And though I am conscious that I will probably make many mistakes, I will not be conscious when I make any of them. And any mistakes I do make, I wish you to attribute to my lack of education and not to any hardness in my heart. I will leave this office with clean hands and an unsullied heart. Now, you may ask yourself, why, if I dislike the office so, would I take this position? And I will go back to the premise I started with. We start off as students in life. We strive, if we're lucky, we succeed. And if we succeed, it is incumbent upon us to become servants. We must be servants of the people, not only those living but for those to come forward. I remember Mr. Madison. He, in the presidency, there was the beginning of factions, political parties, and I thought they were beginning to tear apart the government. And so I began to ask people like Mr. Henry and Mr. Marshall to come, serve in office, and help solve the wounds. Now, Mr. Marshall was being very successful as a lawyer, and he declined. So I summoned him to Mount Vernon and put the pressure of the presidency on him, and he declined. Now those of you who know Mr. Marshall, and many of you I understand are friends of his, know that he fought in the revolution and was with me at Valley Forge and has been a general under my command. So on the third day I realized that he was not going to change his mind just by my asking him. And I knew how his mind worked. So that next morning, before dawn, 
I arose and put on my old general's uniform, and I stood at the doorway of Mount Vernon, and sure enough at dawn when he came down hoping to make his escape without having to confront me, I said nothing but just stood there and reminded him through my uniform of service. And he understood and agreed to run for office and hopefully his career will be long and prosperous. And so it is up to each of you. If you look at our great seal of the United States, you will see that it, on the back is an unfinished pyramid. My generation has laid the foundation for our nation. It will be up to future generations to continue the work that we have started. The revolution is not over. And let me finish up with this. If we cannot make from this country of ours, with its great natural resources, its limitless lands, its freedoms, never before enjoyed by so large a number of people, won for you by your forebears in blood. If we could not make from this a great, happy, and prosperous nation, then you will have only yourselves to blame. Thank you. Now, in our form of government, it is always we, the people, who are the rulers. And here is an opportunity for you, the people, to address concerns to your commander-in-chief. Uh, you may have questions for me. You may have comments or criticisms, even. I will take them, transport them to the federal capital, and do what I can the best to answer them here. And I ask if you have a question, you raise your hand, and when called upon, stand up so that all of your fellow scholars can hear, and so that my deaf old ears, for I've grown not only blind, but nearly deaf in the service of my country, that you ask the question. Now, does anyone have any questions, comments, or criticisms? Nothing about wooden teeth, perhaps? <laughs> Sally Fairfax, of course I know her. She was my neighbor at Belvoir and near my Mount Vernon estate. So you, know, you know, in today's world, men will say of women... Pardon? Men will say of women, she was just a friend. And women will say of men, oh, he was just a friend. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, I realize, sir, that you're a common gossip. <laughs> Sally was a married woman. I was not married. I will say this, that Martha knew Sally intimately, and they seemed to get along very well, whatever the common gossips may have said. And it frankly is nobody's business but Sally and myself. As I understand it, though, she saved my letters to her all of her life. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Sir? Did you design a house for a later president who had to bow down to your uh, plantation to get out of the door? Uh, I do not recall doing that at all, sir. And I would not ask any later president to bow down. In fact, when Mr. Adams assumes the office, uh, it was I who bowed to him. Uh, what, it, what, what, where is this house built that you think you remember, sir? Well, I've been in the house, and I had to bow down to your plantation to get out the door. Oh, is that Mount Vernon? I bowed down to Mount Vernon, but the house was a presence across the way. A president across the way, across the river, or across the field. It was 20 years or 30 years ago. <laughs> well, I remember nothing, but I will say that you probably were in one of the servants' quarters where the doors are low so that you have to go through, and the reason for that is it helps retain heat. Uh, there were no presidents across the river in Maryland. Uh, the nearest presidents later would be 
quite uh, out of sight uh, in Albemarle. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about, sir. I got you confused with Thomas Jefferson. Well, Mr. Jefferson, anything is possible. <laughs> brought up the magic name for me. Uh, I know that Jefferson is a fellow Virginian of yours, uh, of the same class, and one of the reputed leaders of our American Revolution, and you appointed him as our first Secretary of State. Now that you've had some time to contemplate in your position, Your Excellency, could you give us a candid your candid opinion of Mr. Jefferson Monticello? Well, I will say a minor correction, sir. I am not of his class. He is a much more educated man than I am. Um, he is a, a brilliant man in his own way. But I think with Mr. Jefferson, one must look at what he writes and follow those examples and those beautiful words and ignore what he does which is often in contradiction to what he writes. Um, no bills of attainder, he writes, meaning that you can't sentence a man to death without a trial. Yet, as governor of Virginia, he does that very thing. Uh, we must be compassionate and free the slaves. He frees no slaves except those named Hemings. <laughs> We must limit the power of the presidency, yet one buying the Louisiana Purchase, he recognizes that that is illegal. And it is Mr. Jefferson, in my mind, who was the first one in the country to bring up fashion, faction, the political party spirit, to the fore. Now, people will say, tell you that I was a Federalist, and I say I belong to no political party. I do not believe in political parties, and let me tell you why. On a practical level, if you have a congress of people come together to discuss ideas for the good of the people, and you have a small majority of them of a party whose idea and vote is already fixed by that party, and perhaps by a small faction of that party, then what is the good of bringing the people together to discuss the people's opinions? On a more practical and humane level, Party spirit appeals to the deepest recesses of the human heart, the idea of us versus them. It creates a warring faction back and forth where the idea becomes not what is the good for all the people, but what is good for the party. And this alternating faction back and forth, seeking domain over all, creates a spirit dividing the country. And eventually, with this spirit, it may be possible for one of the leaders of these factions, more ambitious or perhaps more skilled than the others, to gain control over everything and then sweep aside the paper assurances of the Constitution. I do not think such a thing is likely, but I think it is an idea that you all should be aware of and guard against. And this spirit of faction was first made apparent to me as president when I discovered that Mr. Jefferson was bankrolling one of the gazettes who were making personal attacks upon me. And he knew that this angered me once I lost my temper in front of him and threw the paper down on the table and said, this man thinks I'm his personal uh, publisher. He knew this, yet he was bankrolling. And I did not know this until after he left office. And it was then that I realized that this man was a consummate politician and not a statesman. I was very much hurt, and we have never been able to recover. Mr. Henry and I had our differences over the Constitution, but we were always civil and were able to discuss and bring things forward. And I offered Mr. Henry many roles under the federal government. But I do not think that after Mr. Jefferson's uh, failure that I could ever offer him anything again. I trust that's candid enough for you, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> Other I've been very concerned about the discord that we have heard about in France. Do you think there might be some way that we can have the young Marquis de Lafayette and his family come to America for safety? There you touch upon a point, sir. The Marquis de Lafayette Gilbert 
Mortier is a, was like a son to me. I have no children of my own. And during the war, we became very close. It was he who taxed me the most about my ownership of slaves. And now that he's imprisoned, I want very much to be able to, as President of the United States, to use my influence to reach across the ocean and gain his freedom. But what we as individuals want, and what our oaths of office demand, we are officially neutral in the contest between France and Great Britain. And it would be a misuse of my office to try and use that to free my friend, because then we would lose our neutrality. Much as the same issue of slavery, much as I am searching for a way to find a way, an end to it, at least personally, I cannot, while in office, free my slaves without disgusting the southern gentlemen and splitting the union. And if this union ever splits, it will perhaps be the end of it. So I do not see a way that I can use my influence to help Gilbert at all, much as I would wish to. Well, what I will do then is end this audience. I will remain behind to drink some Madeira. And if you wish to ask me a question in private or perhaps have a portrait painted with me, then I would be happy to oblige. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience.